Well, uh, first of all, thank you again and welcome everybody. And I want to thank uh, the speakers of the other panelists out here, Abhishek, Ryan, and Shushin. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Anna, for uh, arranging this. My name is Kala Sil. I am the chair of the Information Systems and Business Analytics Department. And I also teach in the MS Masters of Science in Business Analytics program, and as well as in our Information Systems program. So, uh, I think I have a few minutes, right, Anna? So I'm just going to you know, talk a little bit about, I think, today's theme, which is the digital transformation going forward with the technology. Um, I, let me start with a you know, little story uh, for all of you. I think all of you, all of you know about ChatGPT by now, right? Uh, if you have not, you know, if you do not hear about ChatGPT by now, or if you do not know about that, then probably you know you must have been on a vacation on a really nice place or remote place because everybody under the sun and earth and in Mars everybody knows about Chat GPT by now. Uh, so you know I started Chat GPT by asking it to write a nice romantic letter to my wife. That was my very first Chat GPT thing, and it actually wrote something. I took parts of it and then my wife is in India right now and I sent it by WhatsApp. To her and she almost was replying back you know in like you know but before replying she called me and she said what happened to you i mean why are you writing such nice things and i said well that was chat gpt and she was super impressed she was like oh my god i was just going to reply back to you saying good things and and then you know you just had a laugh you know and so so, so that's what I'm just trying to tell you that the artificial intelligence, and especially nowadays, has gone to a level where now it is becoming really difficult for people, you know, to even figure out that you know which part of it is right, which is you no, know, which is real, which is not real, and this is transformative in multiple ways, right? So, integration of that in our life, you know, I call augmented uh, intelligence. And uh, so, so let me just go back quickly. I think technology has always changed our life. Telegraph, right? Then came the railroads and other all the other kind of you know the machines, those things. Then came the computers. Then the internet, and now all of this machine learning, artificial intelligence, all of these things that are coming into the picture. What has happened? Why? Why it is such a big deal? That is because every time. The technology has come into the picture. It has integrated some parts of the society. It's integrated something. And it is the capability. So I call it computation and integration. So in the early days when PC came in, it was the explosion of computation. Then came the internet. And that was integrations of the machines. Then came the digital era. I mean, along with the computer, everything started getting digitized. So that was integration of the information. We don't need multiple channels anymore. Everything is digital, one channel, one pipe is going to take care of all of your needs, right? Whether it's a phone call or whether it's a movie or whatever. So there came the integration of information. And now we are in a stage where it is the integration of the man and the machine. And that integration is happening at a level that is just unbelievable because of the computation power that we have right now. I studied artificial intelligence in, in my graduate days. It was nothing because there was no computation power. And now chat GPT or other kind of machine learning algorithm is just changing everything. Take that, take the IoT on top of that, Internet of Things, right? Take the holograms that are coming into the picture, the metaverse, the virtual reality. I think pretty soon what is going to happen is we're going to have artificial reality and augmented intelligence. I think you know we are going to have uh, this panel discussion, but when Ovishek and you know Ovishek's hologram and my hologram probably will be playing squash somewhere else, or you know go out for a hiking, you know, or Ryan and I are going to have a chat in a coffee shop, you know, our holograms are going to have that you know chat in the coffee shop. So I said that 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 is not too far off that artificial reality, but intelligence is something that we should not give out to the artificial machine. I think. We should use it in a way so that it becomes augmented intelligence. So I think, you know, we are, thank you again in Anna. I think you know, we'll eagerly wait for all of our panelists to hear from them, their views, 
but i think this this integration is happening at such a fantastic pace and such an accelerated fashion that we are going to live in a very very interesting world you know really really interesting world the data that's coming from all of us going into different kind of processing power changing i think the way we know things love things see things it's just incredible and and covid you know even the pandemic took it to a different level doctors who never were open to the technology and now, you know, having video chats and video visits. So, you know, we are going to head towards an integrated world between, you know, the integrated society, no matter where you are, whatever you are doing, and artificial intelligence, metaverse, internet of things, all of those are going to be at the core of all of those. So with that, I will give it over to Anna to introduce our panelists tonight and thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Carla. Uh, that was really a wonderful introduction to our panel and so appreciate your, your uh, introducing uh, the topic and the theme uh, to, to our attendees. I wanted to pick up on two of the points that you made. Uh, one of those is we are in the digital era and uh, we were to have a fourth panelist uh, in our panel today. Uh, He's the CIO of the city of Oakland. Uh, he messaged me two days ago, three or four days ago, and he said, do you know that we are under a ransomware attack? So the city of Oakland is under a ransomware attack. When I went and looked up the news, it indeed was under a ransomware attack. And uh, when I started reading more, I found that there are other cities that have been through a similar situation. So Tony is still working on solving that problem. So he is not able to join us. I'd like to introduce our three panelists who are here today. Uh, Ryan Komagome is uh, an MBA of uh, CBA. Uh, uh, College of Business Administration uh, at LMU. He is the Senior Director of Finance and Analytics at LinkedIn. He was at Adobe before joining LinkedIn. Uh, welcome, Ryan. Next is Sushim Gupta. He is Director of Strategy and Business Processes with Epson Americas. Uh, uh, welcome, Sushim. And uh, we also have Abhishek Rat. Uh, he is Strategic Program Leader, Media and Entertainment with AWS. Uh, the format that we are going to follow today is each of our panelists are going to introduce themselves, their backgrounds, and talk about uh, digital transformation, how they view it, their thoughts, their perspectives uh, uh, it, it, to introduce the topic as it relates to their organization and their backgrounds. After that, we will have a structured Q&A where I will be asking them questions. And then in the last 30 minutes, around eight o'clock or so, Nancy, uh, who is also uh, here with us, will be asking you to post your questions. And then uh, she will be uh, she will be asking those questions or ask you to ask those questions. So that time is yours to be able to connect with our panelists and to ask them the questions that you want want them to address. Uh, so uh, over to Ryan, um, uh, Ryan, and then Sushim, and then Abhishek. Great. Thanks, Anna. Hey, everybody. Um, as Anna said, my name is Ryan Komogome. I'm a double LMU alum, so I did my undergraduate uh, from the College of Business Administration and liked it so much, I came back again for my MBA. So I'm glad that I get to come back and talk to students. So thank you again for this opportunity. Um, most of my working career has been in tech. So as Anna mentioned, my longest uh, stretch was at Adobe. So I was there for 15 years. And recently I made the move to LinkedIn about a year ago. And where I'll come from on this digital transformation uh, panel discussion today is more from the finance and marketing analytics side. I started my career in finance at Adobe and then I transitioned into the marketing world um, and stood up our, a lot of our marketing practices there that allowed us to uh, transform the business. So this talk about digital transformation, I think it, it goes nicely with kind of like the career path I had when I started Adobe. 
um, let's just take Photoshop, for example, probably our most well-known product or Acrobat. We were literally selling those in boxes that would go through your traditional distribution to resellers and then we make it into um, whatever store that you decide to purchase it from. And about 10 years ago, we made the switch from boxes to a SaaS product where everything was delivered online through downloads. Um, and that changed materially the course of the business. Um, that unlocked a bunch of capabilities from the marketing side. It unlocked a lot of capabilities in terms of the organization and how they had to understand the customer because now we're dealing directly with them uh, instead of having middle people. And we also needed to you know, please the customer um, every single day because they're down a subscription plan. And once we sold to them, we weren't done. We needed them to pay us the next month and the next month and next month again. So the level of responsiveness and the level of value that we had to give to the customer um, was, was increased. So over that period of time, as we made the, the switch, uh, marketing made a big switch in terms of how we went to market, um, the different channels that we use so that we could interact with our customers. And that's what prompted me to make the switch from finance to marketing. And over my career, I got to do a lot of cool things. Um, we built marketing mix models. We built attribution models. We built the, um, our first lifetime value models, a bunch of A-B testing, cohort studies, and a lot of other ad hoc analysis to answer questions that we had that couldn't be answered through the existing tools. Um, but after a while, you know, I was there doing that for about 10 years. What I figured out was that no matter how good we got on the marketing analytics side and how many tools that we had and how much insight we could, we could bring about how a market was performing in any given channel was that it wasn't going to, you weren't going to get the full value out of it unless you could convince finance and finance understood what you understood because they controlled, you know, all the purse strings, especially for a publicly traded company. Everything starts with finance. Um, you know, they set whatever the profitability goals are, what the revenue goals are, and therefore what the expense was and how much marketing was gonna get. So until you get finance over the hump, you could have everything and tell them and answer every question, but unless they were at that level that you were at to understand it, you couldn't fully get that change that you want in the organization or why all these tools are built. So when I got recruited to LinkedIn, that was the role to take there. So now I'm in charge of finance for marketing uh, and analytics. So basically, you know, I'm trying to take what I've learned and what I've developed on the marketing side and then put into practice and fund it and figuring out like, what do we believe and what do we not believe? And where we have a high confidence of marketing being effective, we can fund them fully. Um, so that's the vision. That's what we're building at LinkedIn. And that's why I made the, the switch to LinkedIn to try and influence the marketing and digital transformation through a different way. Um, you know, typically, you know, engineering, marketing are a lot more innovative than the finance teams. So getting them up to the same level that a lot of these other teams have gotten to through this digital transformation um, period was key. So that's um, kind of like a quick background. We'll get more into like the details and happy to answer any questions as we get further into the panel discussion. But that's, that's what I have so far. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for uh, sharing your background with us and uh, also why you are, you know, uh, heading in the direction uh, that that uh, you decided to take with LinkedIn uh, after Adobe. Thank you. Uh, so next we have Sushim uh, Gupta, who's at uh, Epson Americas. Uh, thank you, Anna. So um, what I want to do is, yeah, I'll give a brief background on myself. Uh, I want to talk a little more about Epson and Epson America. Uh, I think it's important to understand the, the business itself. Um, I, I know several people may be familiar with Epson or familiar with parts of it, but I just wanted to kind of explain it in a nutshell. Uh, and then definitely want to talk about how we're leveraging digital transformation. Uh, I'll definitely say this right up front that we are definitely much earlier in our digital transformation journey then I think Ryan referred to um, thinking about Adobe and about LinkedIn. Uh, so brief introduction, my name is Sushim Gupta. I'm a director of strategy and business processes. Uh, I've been at Epson for approximately 
uh, 12 years now. Uh, prior to that, I was in management consulting and my background before that was in engineering. Uh, so thinking about kind of Epson, uh, Epson is a Japanese company headquartered in Japan, uh, about $10 billion. And I think the most important thing, and, and you'll see me talk about it more in, in this discussion and in the Q&A, is that Epson sells a very broad range of products. Uh, Epson sells very low-end mass-produced semiconductors. Uh, we're probably one of the you know, not very large number of companies that actually has their own fabrication facilities for semiconductors. Uh, we sell very small personal printers, $60, $70. You can buy them from Amazon or Best Buy, all the way up to half a million dollar industrial textile printers that are printing, that are in Italy right now, printing out uh, very high-end silk textiles for high-end fashion designers. Um, you know, Epson's very focused on hardware innovation, uh, going all the way back to creating the first quartz watch, uh, first miniature digital printer, one of the first handheld computers, um, and a lot of other uh, really uh, key technologies. And so while we think about Epson America, which is where I work, uh, Epson America is the sales and subsidiary, sales subsidiary for Seiko Epson, overseeing sales, marketing, service, and logistics for all of the Americas, so North America and Latin America. Um, we sell the products that I mentioned, all the way from the very low-end semiconductor to the very high-end industrial uh, printers. Uh, and I, I think one of the keys is the, the product line is very complex. Uh, we sell to numerous customer segments, both in consumer and business, and we sell through a variety of very complex channels. Uh, whether it be uh, you know large retailers like Amazon, uh, large distributors and wholesalers, as well as you know much more specific resellers. Uh, and so, what does this all mean when we get back to kind of my group, what I do, and what my team does, as well as how Epson approaches digital transformation? So, regarding my team, uh, have a very diverse set of teams under me. Uh, so. We, I manage our strategy and market analytics group, our market, uh, which does, you know, market analysis, market forecasting, strategic planning. Uh, I also manage our market research group, which conducts quantitative surveys, focus groups, um, and does consumer insights. Uh, manage our project management office, which is uh, focused on improving our processes, uh, as well as helping to develop new capabilities in the organization. Uh, and then finally, manage our retail category management group, which works directly with some of our large retail partners, like Best Buy, to optimize their performance uh, you know, using data. And if we look at all of those kind of teams, our ultimate goal is really to help optimize our sales, marketing, service, and logistics so that we are operating as efficiently, as effectively as possible. And to me, this is where digital transformation comes into play. Uh, at Epson, because we're, primar we're primarily a hardware company, we primarily sell through channels, uh, our focus on digital transformation is really identifying the areas where we can use data and use, you know, develop new digital processes or new digital offerings that deliver the most value. So how do we ensure that, you know, are we, are we delivering the most value to the end customers through a new offering? Are we delivering the most value to our internal stakeholders, whether it be sales, marketing, or the operations teams through dashboards and analyses and insights? Uh, and so all of those, there's a lot you can do. There's a lot of data you can collect. There's a lot of offerings you can provide. The, the key is to make sure that what you're providing has value. Uh, because ultimately, the job of all this digital transformation is to support and help and add value to the stakeholders, whoever those stakeholders may be. Um, so I just want to give a couple examples of things that we're working on just to kind of show how we're leveraging data, how we're leveraging, leveraging digital transformation, as well as how we're ensuring that we're delivering that value. Uh, so I, I think some of these will be very straightforward, ones that you're probably aware of. Uh, others will be, you know, maybe a little more unique to Epson. 
Uh, so one of the things we do since we sell to consumers is we try to understand consumers and understand how consumers view our products, how they perceive our brand, how they perceive our competitors' brands. One of the powers of, one of the really powerful parts of digital transformation and the analytics capabilities now is the ability to collect reviews and analyze them. And so, you know, we are, we work with several third parties to do that, to collect reviews, uh, collect social media posts and analyze them looking for sentiment, positive and negative and informing what we should be doing with our products, with our service, with our marketing. And so it's, it's a pretty simple example, but it's very powerful. Um, I'm thinking prior to being able to collect this data and analyze it, you would conduct consumer surveys or focus groups to try to understand. Now you have a much larger data set and a much more kind of sophisticated way of analyzing the data. Um, another example that we have, um, and I would say this is an example of really making sure we focus is subscription. Uh, so several, for all the printers we sell, we sell the printers and we sell the ink. Um, and so we're always looking at potential subscription models for selling the printers and ink together, uh, you know, with a monthly fee or some sort of usage-based fee. Here, just like with, you know, a lot of other ideas, there are certain customer segments where subscription is valuable it delivers some sort of value to the customer. There's other areas we've evaluated um, in some of our more high-end printing uh, applications where there's very little interest in doing subscription. And I think this is really important in digital transformation in that um, at Epson, we want to make sure we're not just trying to deliver something that is not valuable and focusing our efforts on uh, offerings that are valuable. So we know, in, for example, in consumer printing, there is value to subscription. We know in business printing, there is value to subscription. So we are building out offerings in those areas, but we know in other printing areas, there's no, there's limited value to subscription. And so we're not offering that up. Um, finally, just want to take one other area where I, I know it's kind of a, a big topic now, it's IoT. Uh, so because we have printers, they are mechanical devices and they break, they jam, they break, they need parts replaced. Uh, the ability to track the, how those pieces of hardware are being used, how often they're being used, what issues customers are having is allowing us to deliver a substantially better service experience to our customers. And so again, this is something where there is, we know there's value to delivering this, uh, where we're leveraging IoT to collect the data and then we're leveraging big data to analyze it and again, deliver better offering. Uh, we're looking at, uh, we're, we're building out predictive analytics capabilities that will again, help us to predict when a customer's product may be having an issue so we can proactively service it prior to it breaking. But these are the sort of things where they're very tangible. The, the, what you're delivering has very tangible value to the customer, tangible value to the stakeholder. And I think that's Epson's basic approach. We want to make sure that whatever we're doing has tangible value uh, versus delivering an offering where customers really don't see, or stakeholders don't really see much value in it. Uh, and so that's kind of where we are now. Uh, as I mentioned, we're pretty early stage um, and we're, we're continuing to expand our capabilities, uh, expand our offerings, uh, improving our internal operations uh, through digital transformation. And uh, we look forward to continuing on the journey. Thank you, Sushim. That gives us a good understanding of um, really um, examples of the kind of digital transformation that is happening at Epson. Uh, appreciate your sharing that. Next, we have Abhishek Rath. Uh, he's at AWS. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I, I want to go back maybe 24 years uh, of my career, just kind of step through some of these stuff. Um, when I started my career 24 years back, um, I was I was kind of looking at, uh, and Professor Kala kind of talked about this, it fascinated me. That time we had a term called digitization, right? That's where we started, where 
you started looking at manual processes, you started looking at artifacts in a paper work and then saying that, okay, let's scan it or OCR it, push, push it into some kind of a platform where we can um, use it easily. So that was the, that what, what would I call as the crawl step of digital transformation. So fast forward to 24 years, uh, things have changed a lot. And uh, I think Professor Kala set up a pretty good precedence and Ryan Sushima has kind of talked about some of that stuff um, as a part of their journey. So for me, um, prior to AWS, I was with Sony Pictures for about 17 years. Um, I was in a leadership position managing many uh, of the technology platforms that supported the global theatrical movie distribution um, as well as uh, marketing and uh, you know sales function of the organization. So been through about four transformations. The reason I talk about all these four, not all of them are digital, but some of them are essential why we moved into digital transformation. So the first one dates back to 2007 when um, you know some of you may know we had 35 mm prints and we had 70 mm prints, how the movies were produced. And suddenly uh, we were working on our product, which distributes uh, th uh, theatrical content across the world. The theaters, as well as the integrators who are between the theater and the distributor, which was Sony Pictures, they came and said, oh, well, we want to start using hardware and sorry, hard drive and try to transfer movies through hard drive. So that for me was like an eye opener in terms of a customer's demand whether it's a you know, customer in between the end customer asking to move towards that direction of changing from a 35 mm, 70 mm print to a hard drive and let alone satellite transfers and everything that came along right after that, right? So this was sort of, a, I would say my first sort of role into digital transformation where we had to think about a change in customer behavior, right? Customer is looking for a specific way of distributing content and now as a movie studio, we have to support that process. So that means we have to change processes. We had to change capabilities in terms of technology. We also had to be bring in people who understood how to do this work to be able to encrypt because you don't want anybody on the road finding a hardware and running Spider-Man and distributing it to their friends. That's not good for the studio, right? So we had to have security, we had to have many kind of mechanisms in place to be able to transfer that content to the theater securely. And this is across the world, right? So that was my first exposure. The second transformation I went through was agile transformation, which happened around 2011, 2012. You may think, why is he talking about agile transformation? But I think digital transformation will be more successful if you follow that agile methodology in terms of how you approach solving those customer problems. So going through an organization who was traditionally waterfall into an agile way of producing business outcome continuously and delivering value is an important concept that's an enabler to digital transformation. And agile was been, has been there for 50, 100 years maybe, right? And all of these things were there and Sushim and me prior, so when we talked about this, like we, we did digital transformation, we didn't even know it was digital transformation, right? So similarly, agile existed for a long time and, and that, that was, um, again, brought us back to people, process, technology, like key things that are required for us to be move forward. Fast forward to a few more uh, transformations that I went through. The final one while, while I was at Sony was the marketing transformation. They were looking at not pushing stuff to the customer in terms of campaigns, but understanding what the customer needs and personalizing those campaigns towards those customers. And with the advent of you know, removal of you know, cookies and all that stuff, that process has become very challenging for businesses, right? And to personalize for a customer, to do things that a customer requires for us to do, it just takes enormous amount of effort, governance, and data to be able to get where they need to get to. So I think those kind of opened up my eyes. Fast forward to now. Um, at AWS, of course, this is my personal opinion. This is not representing Amazon formally, but from what we do, it is, it is I, I, I categorize this as three things. It is a continuous journey in digital transformation, but I always look at it as crawl, walk, and run, okay? So 
Digital transformation, one of the key pieces of it would be to first looking at how do you use technology, talent, and process to adapt to customer changes and create those differentiated outcomes for the customers, right? So the first step in our process here is to migrate them to cloud or at least have a cloud presence so they can get that agility and scalability they need, right? Once the customers are in cloud, they look at how to optimize their business processes, right? So second stage, the walk stage is really looking at optimization. And once they understand what they can do and out of the possible, they go to the third phase, according to me, which is basically a run phase, which will be innovation. So I support customers in AWS on media entertainment segment across all these three different pillars of work. And as we go into the details of examples, I'll share a few sort of concrete examples of what we are doing for the media entertainment customers. So thank you again, Anna, uh, for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Abhishek, uh, for walking us through the various digital transformation phases that you've seen uh, throughout your career, or in at least in Sony and uh, as well as AWS. Uh, what we will do now is have all the panelists join me, and uh, we will move into the second part of our uh, panel discussion today, which is a structured Q&A. Um, uh, Nancy, can you help us do that so that we are all all here um, uh, in the in the panel? And in the meantime, I wanted to go back to when I when I brought up the topic of digital transformation and added that to Kala's digitization or digital era. I said I will make two points. Uh, so I did make one point, which was cybersecurity is a major risk and ransomware attacks can happen. The second point I wanted to make is leading us into a digital transformation, that digital transformation helps us in the digital world. Uh, businesses in all sectors, in all business functions are, are looking to digitize. In some instances, as our panelists said, it's for problem solving and improvements. In other instances, it's for innovation. And it could be, as Abhishek said, it could be the various phases. Um, uh, I really liked crawl, walk, and run. Um, or, or it 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 could be that that's that's what the organization needs to do right now, and that's what it's going to do. So I want to open up and ask my panelists, um, where do you see your organization and sector in terms of uh, your digital transformation initiatives, uh, whether it's to do with data or or, or 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 other types of digital transformation, focusing on your organization and sector. I'm, I'm happy to start. I can, I can just, I, I, I think I touched upon it a little bit. Um, I think at, at Epson, um, we are, again, we're early in our, in our digital transformation. Um, and uh, a, a big part of what we're looking at today is how do we ensure we have all of the foundations in place, um, whether it be uh, data platforms, the data itself, um, the governance, the rules of engagement, um, the platforms to support new offerings, whether it be new payment systems or new kind of customer facing uh, platforms. So I think we're, we're looking at all of those things. And right now, I think our, our, our biggest challenge is that we have lots of potential areas to pursue and not enough resourcing to pursue all of them. And so again, it goes back to prioritizing, determining what are those things or offerings we can do, whether again, facing the customer like a subscription or internally using data to do better marketing. Um, what are the things we can do that'll deliver the most value uh, given whatever constraints we have? Um, but I think that there's a, it's. Digital transformation and, and all it entails is one of the top priorities at both at Epson America and at our corporate parent. And so, again, our focus is on identifying, you know, really developing a strong roadmap of digital transformation solutions and then focusing our efforts on, on delivering those. Um, because, again, I think there's a lot of opportunity, um, but we're 
there, there's too much to take on all at once. We do hear that uh, quite a bit for, for with, with the deployment of technology and especially with digital transformation. Um, uh, Ryan and Abhishek, did you want to add to that? Sure, I can, I can chime in briefly. So at, at LinkedIn, um, I'd say different parts of the organization are further along this continuum than others. Our whole product is, um, you know, the flags at linkedin.com and everything, uh, all our businesses are focused off of that. So we have like three main businesses. One is helping connect people that need to hire folks with people looking for jobs. And that's obviously done on the platform. So that platform is very far along in the digital transformation, our understanding of our customers and the usage of the platform. We also have a product for salespeople. So for salespeople to use our platform and to mine the data on the platform to talk to the right people to sell their product. And we also have um, marketing on our platform. Like in the data feed, you will occasionally get marketing emails or sorry, not emails, but ads. Um, you also have your inbox, which is um, in mail, which is also like, you know, companies pay for that to um, market to folks. So everything is based on our platform. So from a product standpoint, I think we're often talked about as best in class. When you talk about the support organizations, um, you know, me more specifically in marketing and finance, we're very early in that curve. So for example, like finance, you would wanna know, um, like, you know, when potentially somebody's gonna stop paying you, like what are the things that you would look at in terms of customer behavior um, to inform like a lifetime value? We don't have a very good handle on that. And we're trying to build data around that and processes around that and models. On the marketing side, you want, you'd want to understand, um, you know, what's the right marketing investment, how to get people to do whatever action you want them to take. We have some tools, but we're definitely not um, a leader there. So a lot of it we're, we're trying to build and to shoot things points where you put the resources. So for us is making sure that our customers have the best experience. So a lot of our resources have gone to the product and the platform itself and some of the trailing organizations, um, support organizations of marketing and finance are, aren't as far on that transformation. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, my role is to like also paint that picture of what do we need to build and like, what is the roadmap to become best in class? Yeah, just uh, from that, uh, just adding from, from um, AWS perspective, um, you know, I, I see ourselves as enablers, right, of digital transformation. We provide the tools and technologies and the frameworks that accelerates customers' uh, digital transformation journey. So if you look at media entertainment, it, I'm probably oversimplifying this, but I would do it anyway, just for, for the construct of, the, of, of this particular session. So we have content production. A lot of people are producing content, whether it's television content or movie content or any kind of user-generated content. The second piece of this is transferring that content in a, some kind of a pipe to where it belongs, right? Whether it's going into a live TV, which is called broadcast, or you go into uh, Netflix and the Disney Pluses and Prime Video and all that, which is basically your D2C, right? All of that, so content, supply chain, which is the pipe that transfers this information back and forth. Then you have the D2Cs, the broadcast, right? And all of these kind of operates with a lot of data, right? What we're trying to do for our customers are essentially making sure we enable them to innovate in each of these areas. How can I make my content faster, cheaper, right? How can I make content that's personalized to a specific set of user groups that I'm targeting to project this content out to. Similarly on broadcast track, how do I make sure my production cost of a live sports is reduced? Can I have a faster way to push this out content and create value added content on top of those particular live games, whether it's soccer, whether it's MLB, whether it's NBA, you name it, right? And then the final thing is D2C, like again, stuff like personalization, how do I provide right type of content to right market those are the type of things where we are seeing customers investing a lot of money, energy, and resources to try to innovate on that space. And behind all of these, data analytics is a core piece. Thank you. 
can you uh, talk about technologies that are playing a key role in digital transformation? Because when we talk about digital transformation, we talk about uh, technologies uh, playing a key role, but we also talk about the business side of it, where business processes and uh, business models and the cultures of organizations need to change. Uh, starting with the technology, can you talk about what are the technologies such as generative AI that Kala mentioned, uh, ChatGPT, uh, that are playing a key role that you're seeing? I can start, um, especially around ChatGPT. So LinkedIn is actually owned by Microsoft. And Microsoft, I think, owns 51% in ChatGPT. So one of the early um, investors in it. So we have been pushed... Um, all of the Microsoft-owned companies have been pushed to integrate it into our products. Um, I can't say too much about it. I don't think I'm at liberty, but like things that you would think of like chatbots, um, you know, customer service being more um, helping to unlock some of that so you don't literally have to have as many people on the phone. Also things around helping content creators on our site to get started with topics. So they don't have to always start from scratch. Um, so, I mean, as we mentioned, ChatGPT is all over the place and we've been pushed um, a lot earlier. Like I think maybe in the last three or four months it's kind of become mainstream, but I know we've been looking at it for a couple of years on what, what that looks like. And um, even like, you know, Bing plus ChatGPT, the whole new search experience that even if you were searched on say LinkedIn.com, like what should that experience look like to be similar to um, a more enhanced search? So that's a big thing we're looking at. I think, you know, everybody, ML, machine learning models are big. Um, you know, I think for us is more supervised models to make sure that the machines don't take over. I've seen some pretty bad uh, cases of where you let the machine kind of run on its own and it kind of runs in places you never thought it would end up, but it does. So um, yeah, that's, that's my two cents. Thank you. I'll kind of jump in next uh, in this. So, so Ryan kind of covered all the good ones, right? Thank you. Um, it's going to be harder for us now to, to level with what you said. But a couple of other things just to add to what uh, what Ryan said. Like obviously we talked about AI ML here uh, quite a lot. I I think I think again going back to the definition of digital transformation, you are trying to create a differentiate differentiated outcome for the customer, right? And what's important there is data and security around the data. So there is a lot of focus from a lot of companies and Anna, to your point, many companies are starting to talk about how can I secure my data, right? What are some of the frameworks, best practices, governances that are available in cloud or on-prem that we can implement? So any kind of structure technologies around security, whether it's AI ML combination, or it's a, it's a framework or, or kind of a security lake kind of a setup, I think there's a lot of discussions around that to making sure the data is secure. Um, I'll also go back to data just by itself and analytics as an overall area. I think that's that's very, very important for you to be successful and do meaningful transformation, right? Transformation for the sake of transformation is not good. You got to find out the right ones and prioritize and do the transformation that makes the biggest value for your customer first and then for the business. So I think analytics and technologies around that, making sure that you have governance around it, you have the metadata structure around it, and how do you encrypt the data at rest in motion, all of those things are important technologies as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Sushila, I will uh, add on another segment to this question and, and, uh, and pose it to you. Um, Epson is a B2B business. And um, uh, as such, therefore, it has other challenges. You're not able to you know, interact with the customer directly and therefore not able to understand. Uh, so how is digital transformation different for a business that's B2B? And also, you know, are the technologies that you're using any different or how are they different? Yeah, um, uh, it's a great question. And you know, I was thinking when Ryan and Abhishek were both talking about it. So yeah. so. Uh, uh, as Anna mentioned, yeah, so so Epson, 99% of our product flows through channels. So we're normally not directly interacting with our end customers, uh, which one of the goals of digital transformation is to deliver a better end customer experience. So 
couple things. So we still, Epson still is trying to focus on delivering that and customer experience. But I, I, the, I think when we want to deliver something, whether it's information or insights or a new offering, let's say like a subscription offering, uh, how we work with our channel partners becomes critical. And so I'll just give a simple example. One of the key things we've launched over the last, let's say two to three years, is a much more automated process to identify end customers whose products are coming up on warranty, who we can potentially sell extended warranties or service plans or other solutions to. If we were a direct to customer company or direct to consumer, we would be emailing them directly. We would be trying to engage with them directly. Instead, for specific product areas, we are providing that information to our channel partners who then they go and engage with the customer. So it does add a little complexity to the actions that we take. And getting back to data and data management, in some cases, we can't share all the data we're collecting with our partners because it may be uh, information provided by our customers that is classified as PII. And so it belongs to us that we can't share. So we might be able to tell a channel partner which company purchased the product. We can't tell them which individual went and filled out a form. And so these are just some of the examples that we have to factor in. Uh, and then again, when we're delivering a subscription offering or another offering, we have to again, think about how do we engage with the channel? Does, even if we're working directly with the end customer, does the channel get a part of that revenue or profit? Um, so all of those considerations have to come into play. And then the final piece I'd say, and I want to start at the end is that the data itself. So much of the data we collect is from our channel partners. It is not, we can't collect data directly on our end customers because we don't have that connection. So from a technology standpoint, the data collect, the, the technology to collect and cleanse the data is critical because we're collecting data. If I'm thinking about in a single segment, we might have six or seven, six or seven effectively disparate sources of data. And within one of those sources, it may be coming from five to 10 channel partners. They don't name a customer the same thing. <laughs> they don't use the same any convention. And so we have to find a way to take all that data and put it together, cleanse it and integrate it. So then we can do something of value. Um, and so, yeah, those are, those are kind of some of the big challenges. It, it really is on how we use the data and how we deliver the offerings and how we engage with our partners. And then when we collect the data, we have some extra challenges in that we don't own the collection of the data. So we have to manage the cleansing and integration of it uh, on our side. But yeah, there's, there's definitely some challenges. And, 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 I, and I believe there's a lot of companies like ours who are working through these same challenges uh, when, when they, they're not directly connected to their customers. Thank you, uh, Sushim. Uh, this one's for Abhishek. So uh, organizations, at least business leaders, agree that digital transformation is important. Yet, according to McKinsey's recent survey, 70% of digital transformation projects fail. What, what can organizations do? Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a great statistic of which I was also shocked to uh, see, um, but not surprising, right? So I think I think again coming down to when you are going for such a transformation, um, the the people, uh, the culture, the technology all have to work seamlessly with each other. Um, what's happening in many cases is lack of clarity in any of the areas can result in the failures. So take an example. Um, the company wants to move faster into, um, into a particular direction of their business. Let's say that you know, um, a media entertainment company wants to release movies uh, faster to um, home entertainment window or the, or the television window or a premium P-word window. Now there's a lot of process that takes place and in between when a theatrical release happens and when a movie goes into a P board or an S board kind of a window. Now, traditionally in media entertainment companies, these divisions 
sat in silo. They didn't talk to each other because those windows were pretty well defined. Now that the movie window is shrinking, that has to be a lot of conversation and change the way you think about a particular content that's traversing through different windows of monetization for a studio. A lot of the times you'll see studios struggling as processes, as people to adopt to that culture of the shifting window. And even if you have technologies in place, you can still solve the problem because people and the culture is still not there yet to be able to solve it. Um, so this, this is practical stuff we have seen with many studios struggling initially when the premium video on demand window came up. Uh, because you know, even your partners were not happy, theaters were not happy that you want to move a movie out of theater after four weeks and put it on a pivot channel and customers are paying $50 uh, to watch the movie. So I think that's what I see. Um, one concept that's come out recently, which fascinates me is called Bionic. I think a lot of companies are becoming what's called Bionic and Bionic essentially means that the technology and people have to be seen as together when you're trying to solve digital transformation problems and not separate. So a lot of companies, BCG has done a lot of research in this space um, and a lot of companies are trying to go towards that direction because once you have those two kind of in sync, the success rate of this can go up significantly because they're in coordination approaching transformation. Really interesting. Um, and I think Carl also alluded to the people and and, um, uh, and machines have to work together. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Abhishek, you mentioned that as well. Uh, this question, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll open it up for your questions. So if you haven't posted, um, please do. Nancy will be asking questions after this. This one's for Ryan. Uh, Ryan, you uh, were at Adobe where you set up the whole data initiative and all, all, all three of you have mentioned the importance of data as it relates to digital transformation. Can you share some of your experiences and any use cases? Yeah, so I, I mean, I'll talk, touch on a couple aspects of the data. One is I think when you're talking about data, most organizations have too much data and they don't know what to do with it. Um, so data is fine, but I think you really want information, which is transforming that data into something that's useful. Um, so normally people wanna hire the data scientists first and the machine learning engineers without a good enough foundation of people that understand data. So it should probably be flipped. You need more data people and then hire the like very few uh, machine learning engineers or data scientists to ensure that what they're using is good data and you know the models are good. Doesn't matter how good the model is or whatever they're building, if the data underneath it is not reliable. Um, the other issue is that the more data you have, the more it breaks. So I feel like we were constantly um, you know, trying to fix data so that these, whether attribution models or lifetime value model, whatever model you have would work. Um, and so just having a team of people that were focused on the data to make sure it's reliable is what's gonna allow the company to then use it to whatever advantage it needs. But it's something I think it's very overlooked. The second thing about data is like, there's been a lot of um, regulations. So first is GDPR. I'm not sure if you guys heard it, but it's something that impacts the EU and changes a lot of how multinational companies have to operate, especially if they're, you know, have websites or presence in the EU. Um, and that's all around privacy. And so that is a material change to how people collect data, what data that they have, and that impacts everything from how they interact with their customers, to their website, to their marketing, and what kind of marketing they can do. And recently, there's been the California Consumer uh, Protection Act, which um, basically takes a similar protection that the EU had with GDPR and now implements it in the US. And so people initially were like, well, it's just California. The problem is with VPN and where a lot of people are anonymous, it protects people sitting in California, even though it may look like they're not in California from like your IP address, whoever they're being routed from. And so what that does is basically you have to treat everybody now um, like they're residing in California, or like the lowest common denominator. And that basically said that you cannot have a separate experience for people in California or not, depending on what uh, information they want to give you. So now if you go to any website, it all says like, do you want to accept these cookies? Um, and that's because of the Consumer Protection Act, the California Consumer Protection Act. And that was a huge, also another huge way that organizations then have to manage data, 
uh, data that they keep, data that they can collect, data that they can actually use. Um, and a lot of that has to do with marketing. I mean, marketing is all about data and you know personalization. So uh, that's huge in terms of how personalized people can give an experience to their customer or their end user or their prospect or whoever's coming to uh, do business with them. So I think those are like probably the two biggest examples around data and how it's changing all the time and you need people dedicated to it to make sure you're, you're within um, the rules and regulations and laws. And then on top of that, to make sure that the data is you know, transformed into something useful. So I can give one last example on data is that, you know, we at Adobe used to know exactly every single time somebody logs into the product, right? And that in itself is a ton of, you know, we have 20 million users on Photoshop logging various times of the day. That in itself isn't very useful, but like what we could do is build profiles. So if you logged into Photoshop between your nine and five, we would say like, hey, you're a work day creative. Like you go to work and that's what you do. You use Photoshop based on your login. And if you either logged in before nine or after nine primarily, then we say like, hey, you're, um, you're uh, at home creative. So you go home and you like to you know, play with photos and things like that. Uh, we also looked at when, um, if you used it in like these high bursts, and we see you're probably a student, you're probably cramming for a project or so. So we use that to then you know, inform to the actual information to classify people and then use that for marketing against them just based on like login. So that's just like a you know, simple example of transforming like data into something useful. And then somebody like a marketer could use to build a campaign to go find students or to go find people who are using it you know, day to day at their workplace. These are great stories. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Nancy, I'm going to hand this over to you for, uh, for uh, questions from our uh, attendees. Great. We have the first question from our own Professor Mascari. He asks uh, or says, I'm curious to see how chat GPT and future large language models will be impacting various business areas in the near future. Any insight from the panelists would be appreciated. Yeah, I can I can go first on this one. Um, I was having a conversation with a customer for, um, a few few day, few days back, a few weeks back, actually in New York. Um, you know, it, just look at education, right? So let's take an example of education and how it can generative AI can impact education. So. The way I see it, I, there are two ways of looking at it. So that could be, that could be some apprehensions around, hey, you know, the students now have ability to go and find an answer to a question um, very quickly by using some of these technologies and tools that are available. And maybe the creative aspect of, of what they're being asked to do kind of diminishes because they have ready access to this information. But always remember that there is, a fact checking that needs to be done as these tools evolve. Um, they are collecting data. I think the quality of the data or the fact is something that's still not fully vetted out. The other angle, if you put yourself in the other side of the story and see how can we use this to our, to our advantage in education would be, let's frame the questions that we ask to our students differently so that when you had to do secondary research for something, and we, we talked about this example when I was talking to my customer is, a lot of us do primary research, secondary research as a part of some kind of an education at some point, right? Primary education cannot be replaced. You have to go and do it yourselves. But when it comes to secondary research, it took us hours and hours of searching in Google and different databases to get to some kind of data that we could use to do our research. Now that time will shrunk, is going to shrink significantly as you start to use generative mechanisms, of course, with the caveat that you have to look at the data quality. So as long as the question that are asked to the students are using this information to, to go into the so what or the implication or the impact, I think there's a good use case here in education for generative AI. Yeah, and I just uh, just wanted to add to what Abhishek was saying too is that the the you know the use of any sort of you know chat or generative AI, I, I think it's a good tool, but it's again I think there's two parts to it. One is you know you have to think critically about how you're posing questions or what data is being fed in and what you're being 
what what's being received. And then in addition, um, you know, and we see this even in simpler kind of word analysis, language analysis, something about like review analysis, is that the ultimate decision makers need to be comfortable with how that insight and those responses are being generated. Uh, because in some cases, if you have a tool that's kind of a black box and no one understands how the outputs are, are arrived at or even at a service level, it becomes more difficult in change management to get people to use those tools. Um, because they'll see a response and say, well, I don't know where this came from. I'm, I don't feel comfortable acting on this. So I'm not going to do anything with it. So that's part of it's just learning and getting comfortable. Part of it is thinking critically about what you're receiving. I think Avisek mentioned, you're always doing research and part of research is to understand what's actually happening. And so I think that, that's, that'll always be, I think that'll be a critical part with any new tool, any sort of AI or machine learning type tool. It's that you, you A, think critically about the response and B, really get a level of comfort needed to be able to use the tools in whatever way you want to do it. Okay, our next question is from Shu Wen. What is your perspective on the revolution of AI? such as ChatGPT and other related technologies. How do you see these developments impacting your company or industry as a whole? I mean, I can, I can take a quick stab at that. I mean, I think we don't know like where it's at the precipice, but um, you know, as I th we think about it is that there, there has to be like clear goals on it, because if you let the technology go off on its own, like it gets into like very interesting place. I'm not sure there's an article about um, how they tried to ask Microsoft for comment about ChatGPT and they said no comment, but ChatGPT decided to comment on its own and it went down a very interesting path. <laughs> um, and so like a little bit with like any kind of model, whether it's ML or AI, like there definitely has to be a human interaction to make sure that it's going in a place that you want it. I can give one example from Adobe. So we had a lot of ML models that try to optimize um, people's experience when they came to the website, but the model had a hard time figuring out multiple objectives. So it was either sell this person everything at all costs. And I don't care if 20% of the people have a good experience and 80% have a bad experience, as long as more people in the end buy versus um, I just want people to have a good experience and give them the product that probably fits best for them versus shoving in something down their throat that's uh, they'll probably buy because of lack of them knowing what's available. Like, you know, we could also tell them the most expensive product. And so like some of these models would then do what's probably not best for the customer. So being clear about like what you're trying to achieve with it, it just goes down a path. And, um, you know, that was one learning for us is that, you know, revenue is going up, things look great but that wasn't completely aligned because we're selling people things that they didn't really need or we're overselling stuff. We're getting a buffet and they just wanted like a dessert. Um, and so that's where I think it's, it's gotta be clear on kind of like how you use it and to like Dr. Seal's point of view, it's like augmented um, you know, information versus like it's going on its own artificial. This next question is a two-parter. What do you think is the one digital transformative advancement you would like to see your company move forward to? And then on the contrary, is there anything within digital transformation space that you would not want your company to incorporate or see as hurting or hindering the company's growth? That's a, that's a very difficult question. Whoever has asked us to get some bonus points in whatever course they're doing at LMU. Um, let me let me take a let me take a stab at it from the perspective of what are non-negotiable, right? I think being customer obsessed, um, I think from our perspective, privacy of customer data is it's a non-negotiable, right? So in fact, um, when we do work with our customers, and uh, anything to do with their real data, we would never touch it. That's not something we'll go into. So whatever um, you know, technology or ability that that will that will get us to that data, it's it's always absolute no no. So I think that's like a non-negotiable. I would say 
making sure we respect that boundary, I think will be super critical. Um, anything else without the ethical and the privacy boundaries, I think that helps us in uh, getting people to their outcomes faster. I think all those technologies are welcome, but always these two would be sort of the guardrails to make sure that we are staying uh, customer focused and customer obsessed. That would be just what I think immediately. Okay, moving on to Tyler's question. When stuck on an issue, what kind of practices do you do to get more creative with successful solutions? Um, I, I can, I can go quickly is I think just opening up to a lot of folks. Um, I tend to feel like the younger people in the organization have the most ideas and people who are new to the organization, because that's if you're stuck, you're probably with a lot of people who've been there for a long time doing things the same way. Um, and normally the decision sits with somebody who's senior or they want somebody senior to chime in. But I feel like pushing it back down into the organization gets you a lot more creativity if you're stuck. They approach it in different ways. Um, they'll give you other ways to assess the situation that you probably haven't thought about. So that's kind of what I do in, in our organization. Definitely that, like just to add to Ryan's, I think that's a great point, like talking to talking to other individuals within your community um, and across different groups sometimes, right? If you're working on a specific area and somebody else in a different area, a different industry even, asking for a problem and solution to them, a lot of times it works. The other thing is going back to the fundamentals of problem solving, right? Anything you're trying to solve, I'm going to simplify this again, there are inputs, you're doing some process and there are outputs, right? And if you ever get stuck, look at what's coming in, what do I need to do, what needs to be the output and see what you can control and what you cannot, right? As long as you have this framework in mind, you should be able to find out those lines, the inputs, processing and output to be able to solve problems. I know it's very theoretical at this point, apply it once to problem solving and you'll see you can find solutions because I think a lot of time we're stuck as Ryan was saying, whatever we know, we just think that's, this is what it should be. Why is it not happening, right? But there are other inputs, there are other outputs that are also possible and it's the right ones. This next question is specifically to Sushin. Regarding the data and gathering data, are you worried privacy policies will make it harder to cleanse and access the data? Absolutely. Um, again, because the data is collected by various parties, they have certain policies in place, not even talking about laws and regulations, they have their own policies and agreements in place, even being able to collect that data. And then um, this is also very important. And I think uh, as it comes to data collection, it's okay, I have the data, but what can I actually use it for? What am I allowed to use it for? What is the customer allowed me to use it for? So yeah, and, and we see that all the time where uh, we have been collecting data for a specific purpose, either from our partners, and it, it could be end customer data from our partners. And either the end customer has agreed to provide the data with some conditions, or we've agreed, the partners agreed to give us the data with some conditions. We want to change what we're doing with the data, how we're using it, whether it's for delivering solutions or marketing. and all of that requires coordination. Um, and again, this is not even getting into laws and regulations. This is simply just policy. Um, I mentioned the IoT data that we're using. Uh, right now, our policies are, and this, our corporate policies are that any usage data that we collect, IoT data that we collect, can only be used for, to directly serve back to the customer for their benefit. But if I, for example, want to say, well, I want to, I want to identify my most profitable customers because they use the products the most and I want to go market to them. At this current time, we're not allowed to do that. So that does limit the use of the data, right? The, the access and cleansing of the data, um, even though it's our own. And then we have many instances of uh, data we've collected from partners that we just, we can't, we have to redo our policies, redo our agreements in order to be able to use it. So absolutely. Um, I think this is a general, topic to say you have to have clarity about what data you want and what you want to do with it. And I think going back to Ryan's point, 
sometimes you have too much data or you're trying to get too much data. And it's very possible that a large amount of that data just really, you don't need to do much with it. So you need to be very thoughtful about what you're trying to accomplish before you just say, well, I want all the data or I want all of this. So absolutely, it's, it's a great question and completely, completely agree. Sushin, we have another question for you. You mentioned you do not always have access to the consumer data. Is there a way to enhance or streamline the collection and cleansing of data from your diverse partners? Absolutely. So, um, so I uh, starting with uh, whether. Uh, so I'd say um, our priority right now is actually collecting our business customer data because we feel we can extract more. Frankly speaking, we can extract more value from that data. So what we've done is we've embarked on kind of an exercise over the last couple of years to identify where we might have what I'll call pockets of data and then improve those processes. So as a simple example, we provide sales incentives to our partners to sell product. But in order to get credit for the sales incentive, they need to provide us with who they sold it to, what they sold, the serial number of the product. That data we've had for a decade, two decades. We've never really done anything with it, but that's one of those pockets of data that we have uh, basically set up a data feed directly now, and we have a cleansing process in place to be able to ingest and use that data. Um, on the consumer side, yes, completely agree. So one of the things we're focused on is, uh, <laughs> it's a pretty simple thing, um, is product registration. You buy a product, we find incentives or ways to encourage consumers to register their product, right? Uh, we have a simple process online to do it. And again, that's a way to streamline the collection of the data. And if we're collecting it, then we can cleanse it as well. We can collect clean data. So yes, yes, uh, that is, those are, we're a big focus for our digital transformation right now is, is kind of laying that data foundation and a data cleansing foundation and increasing the data we're collecting from our end customers. Okay, and this is for any of you. Do you see the US adopting the same level of stringent privacy laws as those seen in the European Union or will it always have a softer approach? Uh, the Consumer Protection Privacy Act is similar to GDPR. So in, in the digital world, um, I mean, it's close to being on equal footing. Uh, where the future goes, I'm not an expert in, in policy, yeah. uh, but currently uh, they're very similar. Jump back. Yeah. To... Sorry, Sorry what, go I, ahead. what I would also add to that is since, you know, since corporations, multinational, global, whether or not a specific country you know, even if even if privacy laws aren't exactly the same across countries or across, re across regions, I know even that at Epson, although we have a separate sales subsidiary in Europe, we pretty much apply the same level of protection and policy, regard uh, whatever the most stringent is, regardless of what country we're operating in. So it's just because the the the, the idea of boundaries of data between Europe, United States, Asia, it's there's not there's not as much boundary. It's, it's a little blurry, at least for our company. So. We have another question from Professor Mascari. What is an ethical or data privacy challenge faced by any of the panelists in their work? Any areas they think regulation is needed? Uh, one for me is on the ethics side is uh, honestly, nobody reads the fine print, right? Like when you look at the cookies and are you accepting this cookie or that cookie? Um, a lot of times in that fine print is you're allowed to collect first party cookies, which are people who come to your website, which changes that when people entered your website previously, they came with a bunch of other cookies that you could access, the third party cookies. So now the big, the big question is, do you sell your first party data to other companies? so that you share data um, and then therefore kind of through a side door, get the information that you had before, but now it just needs a bunch of people aren't going around the internet with all their information attached to them anymore. Um, 
but you can still build it if you have enough partnerships with other companies. And there's a lot of other companies like third parties that'll do this uh, securely, like uh, LiveRamp is one of the larger companies that basically aggregates data from a bunch of other companies and then anonymizes it and then you know tells you you know where your people have gone and helps you with marketing campaigns. So I think you know that's one thing is that uh, they're really trusting these companies because very few people even know like what's what's in the agreement and how you want to treat your customers data. And the final question, it was mentioned that the customer is a key priority in the success of digital transformation. In what ways do your companies ensure that the customer is happy with the trajectory the company is moving with technology? I think, um, you know, as I was kind of opening up in my introduction, for every company, it's a journey. So part of the journey, as I talked about, was crawl, walk, and run, right? So when company embarks on any kind of digital transformation, um, you have to be able to provide the customer a vision of what the art of the possible is, right? Um, and it's not, it's not a jump from one to the last, it's a continuous process of improvement. So you, you do a few steps to give them the sense of progress. So from our perspective, every time you work with customers on any of these journeys, it is very important to stay focused on the end vision, end goal of the vision, right? And as you move through the process, continuously getting outcomes, that is, you're able to tie it back to that ultimate goal that you have. Because what I have seen in my career is if the customer doesn't feel a sense of progress in the direction you want them to go, they're gonna be detached from whatever they're working on and they'll say it's not working. So it's very important to keep, stay focused on that ultimate vision and then go those baby steps and give them those outcomes that ties back to that ultimate vision. I think that's that feedback loop is necessary to keep the customer engaged uh, towards uh, achieving that end goal. And just to just add on, yeah, to completely agree with what Abhishek said. I mean, I, I think ultimately, and this should be done before embarking to say, what am I trying to achieve? Right? I'm trying to achieve, I'm trying to accomplish something with this digital transformation, whether it's a process efficiency or you know, increase customer satisfaction or increase sales. And by having that, it, you really want to, part of the digital transformation development is to have a way to monitor in some way, shape or form, what is happening after that thing is launched, whether it's surveying customers or monitoring usage or monitoring site visits, or these are simple examples, but, and, and that's a, a simple way to kind of determine that, yeah, the, customer is happy with the trajectory. Now, of course, you can go deeper and do customer interviews and focus groups to really understand, but you should have a clear goal in mind. And, um, and so I can say a simple example, we, we launched something not to this and where we were doing much, much more targeted engagement campaigns. And the first step we did was effectively a pilot, I guess, to evaluate, well, are people actually engaging? Is, is, is what we're proposing to do is actually engaging customers. Are, there, are they visiting our site? Are they going to the right places? Are they, are they engaging with what we want to or not? And if not, we need to go and reevaluate what we're doing. So I think that's, it's really important to have that goal in mind or objective in mind before embarking. And so that it makes it easier to evaluate moving forward. Yeah, I'll say one thing on the B2B business, it normally is like you have a customer advisory board um, because you have so much at stake, especially you're going to have you know 20 or 30 strategic customers that make up a large chunk of um, your bookings or revenue. And then for us, like on LinkedIn uh, or most online type of uh, companies, every day like they're running you know hundreds, if not thousands, of A/B tests. So they're constantly testing things against you know a small segment of their customers to see whether or not that's it adds incremental value or engagement or whatever that metric is. So there's very rarely like big things that are rolled out. Um, they're tested incrementally all the time. And so you, you know, real time. And that's part of the whole digital transformation is you get real time feedback on whether or not that worked or didn't. It didn't shut it down quickly. If it worked, you know, you start to get to statistical significance. And then when you get there, then you probably do a broader rollout for your, all of your users or customers.
Uh, that that is really helpful. Thank you so much. I want to uh, ask one last question, and that's for all three of you. And that is, so how can I students prepare for this digitally transforming world? If they're interested in working for any of your companies, for instance, um, how, how should they be preparing while they're in school? I guess I'll, I'll go first. If no, is um, for me when I was entering this space is like digital transformation and analytics, such a broad field. Do a one, do a ton of information on interviews. Like try and network and figure out. I mean, analytics, digital transformation exists in every part of the business. So you'll need some, you know, I'd say basic skills, like foundational skills that can go and be taken with you wherever you go in an organization. But there's also some job specific skills like for me it's you know marketing so you don't have to be a marketer but it's good to know some of the concepts of marketing so that you're applying your models your analytics to that because you're talking to marketers right and so you need to know a little bit their language and making sure they understand your concepts so first is figure out like what do you want to do in this very very broad field and understand like what people do on a day-to-day -day basis and then from there I think you can kind of build back um, a path like you're going to get a great foundation from the programs at LMU but then getting that next level of, of uh, training, like through some of your maybe elective classes, like in marketing or in uh, product design or something, um, but that'll help you set up for more specific job within analytics or you know digital transformation. Just, just adding to what Ryan, um, Ryan was saying, like networking is number one, of course, he talked about that. Um, talked about specific set of courses. I, I'm going to put a little spin to that whole point that Ryan made there is depends on what kind of jobs you're looking for, right? There is a continuum of jobs that are available in each of these phase. Just take AI as an example. And then I think Ryan beautifully put that saying, nobody is looking today to build, uh, to just take Lego pieces, right? They want to build something out of the Lego. That's how I typically put this, right? Because companies are looking for business outcomes, business solutions. So you have to understand not just, hey, I will write a machine learning algorithm. It is going to do that. That's not enough anymore today to be successful. I think what's needed is you understand the context and purpose behind what you are doing. Uh, and that's important. So do the courses that will give you that understanding. But again, depending on whether you're going to a hardcore tech field, or you're actually going to be that business leader who is going to enable tech teams to work, your knowledge, subject matter knowledge has to be quadrupled as you're going towards a business leader. So, so depending on where you are on that continuum, you're going to have that context, but as you move towards a leadership position, you will be more sort of away from technology, just understanding structurally how it is, but really understanding to focus on the business, business processes and outcomes. And just to, I think, Abhishek said it very eloquently. I, I think one of the most, I'm thinking about at Epson especially, so because again, we're, we're a little earlier on the digital transformation journey, that really focusing through all your coursework and all your research on, yeah, what is the business outcome and the business result that anything you're doing is moving towards? Because ultimately, you know, if you're a decision scientist or data engineer, or whatever, you know, whatever the title is, there's somebody at the end of the line who's going to make a decision based on the data or the insights coming out. And that person or those people need to a, understand the value of what what's being done and then be be comfortable enough with how it's being done to take action on. It. And so constantly thinking about, OK, I'm, I'll take a simple example. I, I have this wonderful customer segmentation model that I'm, I'm taking loads of data. It's like, well, wh what are you doing with that segmentation model? It, are, are, you, are, are we taking action on it? Are we targeting marketing campaigns based on the customer segments or products? And if not, or if that's not really a goal of the company, then the segmentation model is nice, but it's not very helpful because it doesn't lead to, I think the obviously said a business outcome. So I would just really encourage uh, and I know from from me personally and for my team, it, it's really about how what we're doing is helping the business, not 
how cool or how new and fancy or innovative is the technology that and process that you're using uh, because that's not helpful that's not as helpful as as kind of really helping an outcome so i would just encourage you to always think about the outcomes think about how the business can be helped with what you're doing um, and that'll i think that'll go a long way um, in, in all these areas sounds fantastic um I want to thank you all, our fantastic panelists, to uh, to share your insights, your experiences with us. Um, I also want to thank Kala, my chair, for joining us, Nancy, so much, and also want to thank uh, all of the attendees for your really, uh, really great questions. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and good night. <laughs>